All right. Welcome, Karen Bliss. Thank, Thank you. you for joining me. And uh, I know there's people that watch live and there's people that watch recorded. And I know we're going to, you know, give some great information for a whole bunch of people. You are the Canadian correspondent for Billboard and you are editor, founder, everything of <laughs> Samaritan magazine, which I would love for you to tell people about because I think it's wonderful what you do. I like to call it the anti-tabloid. It's uh, an online magazine about people trying to make a difference. It's not good news. People always think it's a good news site. And I'm like, no, it's actually shitty news, but it's good people trying to change shitty stuff, bad stuff. So uh, yeah, it's been great. No shortage of people trying to make a difference in many, many different areas. Yeah, you know, I find that there's so many people that are trying to do good. And I always do that with my clients. Like I love to, you know, start philanthropic campaigns and it's just great that you are calling attention to it. Yeah, I mean, there's always something, right? Like whether it's in their family, ALS or cancer, yeah. um, or, you know, maybe they're a big animal lover. I mean, it's just endless. There's just, and when I started it, I just thought of, you know, the ones that we always talk about and there's all a run for this and, you know, raise money for, you know, cancer and building wells and education <laughs> schools and things. But like, there's people that, wake up at 5 a.m. and go feed, you know, cats in alleys or knit blankets for cats or um, I, I, there's just so many things you're like, oh, that's interesting. Even those guys that like dressed up as superheroes and like climb up, you know, the windows at the hospitals. And uh, yeah. so it's been amazing. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, I, I love that you call attention to that. And I also love that the Canadian government loves arts. It really seems that way, huh? I mean, you know more well, about that than I. Government, it depends what government we have. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's always an element. There's always been grants. It's, it's not always like, better than America. So. It, it, it's, it's not like the conservatives come in and suddenly everything's like cut off. Like, it's not like that at all. But there are governments that are more support supportive than than others and uh Trudeau definitely appreciates and supports the arts I remember him many 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 years ago uh being at the Juno Awards he wasn't even in politics at that time and hanging out with uh David Usher from a group called Moist at the time I'm going way way back but mm -hmm. he definitely likes his music yeah totally um and so what I want to ask you is, is the scene in, in Toronto, like, is it a small world? Is there, are there so many people that it's, that you don't know everyone or what's it like? No, we know everyone. I mean, actually it's a great community. Um, you know, you could go to the horseshoe on a Tuesday night and see everyone, you know, from the labels and management companies and publishing companies. I, I say, we know everyone, but I got to say the older I get, the less people I do know when I actually go out to, to shows. I'm like, you know, because there's a whole crop of new newcomers yeah. and I'm not necessarily in touch with them because, you know, when I started, I was like the indie chick going out to see all the bands and in contact with the A&R and managers and um, but we all kind of moved up together. So, mm -hmm. you know, and also there's no like indie columns anymore that I, I was always in, in touch with, you know, the art artists coming up and unsigned artists. And, and that's why a lot of the bigger artists today, I used to go see them when they weren't signed or maybe some of my management friends worked with them or someone I know signed them. Right. So yeah, there's, I guess there's a lot of people I don't know, but essentially it's a small community. Yeah, I was thinking it would be because even New York, as big as it is, is like a small community. Um, but uh, yeah, I you, we were talking before we got on here about freelancing. And I think it's important that publicists know the challenges that freelancers have before they pitch them. 
I see a smile. Yes. I know something's coming. Well, <laughs> I mean, I've always been a freelancer. Even if I do have regular gigs, which I have, that's how I've been able to, to make a living. But I've been a self-employed, full-time freelance music journalist since I was probably 20. I mean, I, you know, I was starting when I was like 18, 19, 20. So uh, I think I still lived at home. I can't remember. So I probably didn't have those, you know, financial burdens. Yes. And then just kept at it and at it and at it. And back then I would juggle all different types of publications. So I would write, I, I mainly got my start writing for the trade. So there was, uh, it was called The Record which was our equivalent to Billboard. And I wrote for them for many, many years, um, learned a lot, like that's how I got to know the industry and learn about the industry. Um, but I would also write for pure music publications or even a fashion mag, and I would write the music uh, for that or for a uh, movie publication that would be in the theaters and I would do the music. So. I always had to pick up a lot of work. Now there's way less of it. The, the publications, the print ones have gone under or they're taken in house. Um, here we've got very, very few or they don't pay enough. You know, they don't pay enough for, for me. Um, I did through uh, Bill Crandall uh, work for Rolling Stone for probably a dozen years as the Canadian correspondent. Uh, obviously that was one of my dream jobs yeah. um and billboard is my ultimate dream job because the industry that's what i love and that's what i love writing about um i wish i could write about more canadian happenings for them but they are u.s yeah. and that's what a lot of publicists in canada need to understand you know i wish i could write about you know this person getting promoted or starting a, a small indie label, but I can't for Billboard. Right. So right. I, I do write for FYI Music News, which is our oh, yeah. Canadian um, trade that David Farrell, who gave me my one of my first jobs, it wasn't my first job, but my first proper uh, trade writing gig at the record, he and that folded. He disappeared for a number of years, came back and started FYI. So I, I work for him. Yeah, I've heard of FYI. I think I pitched FYI a number of years. Um, so I think that people want to know. Publicists definitely want to know how it's best to pitch people. Like, and I know people should read you before they before they pitch you, right? You know, I mean. Well, I mean, in my circumstances with Samaritan, that's a good example because I don't want, Samaritan is very music heavy for obvious reasons. And right. all my writers or most of my writers are music journalists as well, or were at some point, but it's not a music publication. Right. It is specifically about charities and causes. It could be about a business. It could be the actual charity itself. It could be uh, an eight-year-old kid with a lemonade stand. Um, it could be, you know, a business with a product and proceeds go to, you know, such and such. But I do get a lot of music pitches and people just lump me in. They're like, oh, would you like to interview so-and-so or write about this for Billboard or Samaritan? Right. But first of all, Probably that what they're pitching me is not Canadian. So no, I can't write about that for Billboard. Right. The odd time I will write about something that's not Canadian, but typically not. And the other thing is I don't see a cause or a charity. Like I think they basically just sniped and stolen my email from somewhere and they don't bother to check what Samaritan is. Yeah. That's one thing. Um, I think and that I happens get, a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. I just say, can you remove like, yeah. don't send just music pitches to that email um and i get a lot of generic emails mm -hmm. so it looks like it's to me but it's not really to me but also i don't have enough outlets to to write for like if i, I wish i did and i might be a bit more proactive now that you know there's a pandemic and i i've definitely written way less the past year there's way less work because 
of the impact of the live touring yeah. business basically shuttered, people don't understand that that impacts publications, music publications and, and a billboard right. because they get revenue from advertising and true advertisements. And so everyone's had to be very, very careful. And, you know, I've definitely had less work, but our government's been great. They yeah. have um, definitely utilized um, the monies that are available to me during those times that I needed it last year. This year, I, I think I'm good, hopefully. But, good. but yeah, they had like about two grand Canadian a month available to people. That, um, That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah, see, I, I think Canada's approach to the arts is so much more civilized than ours. But uh, yeah. I mean, that's not just for the arts, that's for any yeah. individual that, you know, was having financial difficulties. Mm. And so. Yeah, well, also, um, I keep thinking about other ways that journalists can make money and publications can make money. Right. And have you seen Substack? Have you been on Substack? I no, I don't know what it is. Well, I've been reading a lot of newsletters and they have like a free thing and then they have a subscription thing. And the subscription site is Substack and they'll give you like a taste of it for free. But then if you subscribe, like, have you ever thought about doing something like that? So what, what's the monetary component for that? Um, it's subscription. You know, it's I like... Mean, I Oh, for my work, you mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't think anyone would pay to read my stuff. I seriously <laughs> don't. We're in this world where no one wants to pay for stuff, right? Yeah. And um, I remember even back before that was acceptable, you know, record companies would staple, uh, do those little promo kits, and then they'd staple all people, like photocopy people's articles, and they'd send it out to other journalists, like with the bio and the CD and everything. <laughs> and it's like, you know what, our country's so small. And, you know, if I wrote for Canadian musician, and they're photocopying that, it's like, can you not buy 100 copies? Like, that's my work, right? But I think there's a law that that's, if you're not ultimately making money from it or something, you can do that for promotional purposes. Yeah. But, you know, I still think it would be nice to get support for these publications back then. So, yeah. you know. But. I was on a couple of Clubhouse rooms. Yes. Are you on Clubhouse, by the way? I just joined, but I got to tell you, I hate all this stuff. Yeah. I'm like the worst on Instagram. I don't get it. I scroll like four photos. I'm like, why do I want to see someone's photos? Like I don't, I really do not un understand the appeal of Instagram. So <laughs> if I was on Shark Tank, I would not have invested. Like, <laughs> so all this stuff uh, takes yeah. the hashtagging and the this, that. So I did, I did join it. What am I supposed to do with it? Well, I, I'll tell you because yesterday I was in a room uh, with all these publicists and journalists, and we were talking about like pay to play and how a lot of publications have gone that direction because they have to, you know. I saw the Rolling Stone, right? Well, yeah, that, that too, but then they also are like going to vet you to be able to pay them which is an interesting concept. Right, they're trying to get it, make it like a think tank. And this is a way to expose those people that have something to say to a bigger audience. Yeah, yeah. And, and th there was this one guy and he was saying, he's a publicist and he's a uh, business development person at a, at a magazine, a part owner. And okay. he doesn't see it as pay to play, like he doesn't see it as a conflict of interest if he covers his own clients i mean i know publicists that were also journalists and there's a couple that still do that i have mm -hmm. a bit of an issue with that um it depends what he's doing in terms of business development i mean if it's just business development and he's not and he's yeah he's not the decider state, like it's like we'll cover you if you know yeah i don't know yeah, I mean, it's hard. It's like a slippery slope, I think. You know, there is definitely, um, 
there's definitely like both sides have a point and you know i i just the question wound up being what the hell are journalists supposed to do to make more money and i well, was like wow none of us have an answer for this i personally wouldn't like i still get kids like just this past week from a journalism program saying oh can i interview you for this school assignment and or you know one of my friends saying oh my kid wants to know what you do they want to be a music journalist and i would never discourage them because <laughs> decades ago i was discouraged by someone and i remember it clearly yeah um a, a fellow music journalist had told me not to bother um like i was writing for the varsity u of t interviewing the cowboy junkies at the rivoli see it's all coming back um and and this music journalist went to say hello to the the junkies and then asked what I was doing and then said like not to bother. Clearly I didn't listen. So I would never discourage someone. There's always enough work. There are publications all over the world. There are paying publications. There's publications that are not for profit that pay. Um, maybe it will be hard to be a music journalist strictly. Right. Also, you can't just suddenly say like, I want to be a music journalist. Like it really, you know, I was sneaking into bars to see bands like when I was 16 with my fake ID. So <laughs> it is a lifestyle, as you know. Yeah. It's very weird for us to be home like oh, a year yeah. without seeing concerts. It's a, like, I, I haven't had this type of lifestyle since I was living at home at 15, <laughs> you know, but 16, 17, I was seeing bands four or five nights a week so it's yeah. uh it's a withdrawal yeah i'm definitely feeling that too and i was the one who would always avoid going to shows now i can't wait to go to shows so and i didn't go see as many as i used to because when i moved from an apartment to, to buying a house my everything tripled yeah. so that's another reason why you know if i still Live, you know, first of all, if rents were still 800 bucks a month, which they're not, um, uh, I would be able probably to, to write for anyone and just have this lifestyle. But I like to think I've grown up a little and I'm not living like a, you know, frat girl or frat boy. <laughs> so, but I do bios, as you know, yes. on the side, I kind of call it my prostitution because sometimes the artists suck. Not the ones you send me, but sometimes, <laughs> sometimes you know, the person yeah. off the street. So my name is not on the bio. No. That person's fantastic. The songs are great. <laughs> um, it's like me writing a press release, too. You know, I mean, yeah. it, you know, you, you, you go with the agenda that's presented to you. But, right, but uh, you're more selective about the clients you take. Like, you're not going to be pitching me. Well, I can me. be now, but I was at a label. If you pitch me five acts in a row and they all sucked, I wouldn't pay attention to you. So you have to be careful too, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and you know, I think when you're at a label, you don't get to choose. But I get to choose now, which makes me happy. Um, so I love my clients, and that's awesome. But I think also... Um, Another thing I wanted to ask you is, you know, what is something that journalists do that you like and what is something they do that you don't like? I mean, not journalists, publicists. Yeah. Do we have enough time? No, oh, sorry. yes. I'm just joking. Um, I, you have to tell me if this is unusual. I have a few issues, let's say. <laughs> um, okay, so one is I am a crazy fact checker and I often find that and it's always little bits because I might do an interview and someone will say like did when they meant didn't or the timeline doesn't make sense like I have this way that I can read through transcription and I'm like okay they said this but that doesn't make sense because of this or you know or maybe they've missed something um so I need to fact check and Oftentimes, if someone says like, oh, you didn't quote me properly or if I didn't say that, which doesn't happen too frequently to me, I record all my interviews and I can say, yeah, you said that. And I'm so surprised how many times someone will go, oh, no, 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 that's not what I meant. 
You know, it's very interesting to me because people have this view of the press that we make all this stuff up or misquote, but people would be very surprised at the things they say that they didn't mean to say, or they missed something important or a key, or just they didn't enunciate and it sounds like did when it, you know, so that, so, but oftentimes I find like publicists are like, oh, that's like once the interview is done, like they might pitch, pitch, pitch. And then I do the interview and then I don't hear from them again. Don't get a thank you, which is fine. I don't really expect it, but it's interesting when you're in co constant contact with someone for the longest time about something. And then that's it. You send them the link. They don't say thanks. They don't promote it because I need eyeballs on Samaritan. Yeah. I want to make it bigger than TMZ, you know? And yeah. so I need that too. Um, yeah. So and yeah, then, fact checking is very, very important. And that's um, funny because the opposite end of that is then they go, I didn't say that. And I, then you'll tell me, yes, they did. They said it here, listen. And then I'll go back to them going, you said it. And then they'll be like, can you get it taken down or changed? Yeah. I mean, I oh, want to, like, I want to be accurate. Like I want to write a story that's accurate and factual. Like when someone asks me to write a bio and they don't want to put in something and it's like silly like like say they had an old band that had a deal and they toured but they don't want that mentioned or they want suddenly their new album to be their first album when they really like that stuff's just stupid to me like as a journalist it would just annoy me yeah and, it, and that happens a lot as well you know yeah um yeah. so and the other thing it's only two things that so that the fact checking um, so my favorite publicists are the ones that let me fact check and I can drive them crazy with like a zillion little things I need to know. And my editors, my good editors, like I have editors that will just like post my stuff and not even read it. But the, but the ones that I learn from to this day are the ones that will pick apart, especially for the US for Billboard because they might not know things that are common to me that they might not know about funding or things like that. Yeah. So they will, um, like I had an incident with a, with a editor who didn't know the term responsible agent, even though he had been a, a, a editor or a journalist for many years, but maybe that's, um, I don't know if that's a Canadian thing or an industry thing. So, mm -hmm. and it really is just the responsible agent at a, at a booking agency, like yeah. your person. And the other thing was song plugger. Um, I was writing about a song plugger, but I don't know if you guys call them song pluggers. Yeah, it's a very I British call them trackers, radio trackers, which we use too, but they also you would say you're a song plugger. Mm. Um, and, the, and my editor, a different editor, didn't know that term. Mm. So, like, you know, an editor is going to challenge me and ask me these things. So I don't see anything wrong with me asking the publicist to go back to management or sometimes they don't deal with management. They, in Canada, maybe they're in touch more with international and then the international has to contact management. And I know it's, it takes a long time to fact check, but don't you want the story to be accurate? You know? Um, and the other thing is liner notes. I am shocked. This has been going on for at least 10 years, if not more. I have to often beg, send six to eight emails say, before I do an interview to get the freaking liner notes. I don't get Like that. they just send me like the, like a link to the songs and a bio. But I want to know like the publishing credits and who played on the album and maybe there's something weird in the thank you notes or you know this engineer or like I want all that stuff that's how I grew up and those are the best interviews I don't want to ask lame questions because I don't have liner notes or lyrics and it sometimes I don't get them at all which I don't even understand them not having them I'm talking major labels like everyone they don't send them to journalists so that means these people are doing interviews and, you know, and the journalist is going, who produced the record? Who did you co-write with? No, you should know that before. Yeah. And then you can ask better questions. 
but it's, I don't get it. I mean, I know we're in the digital age, but like, come on, like that is crucial to me. That is one of the reasons though, why I do this, because I want people to know what you need. I want people to be able to get you what you need in order to do like the best job possible, because isn't it our responsibility, both of us to make the best content? But so do you get other journalists? Like I always, I'm under the impression that like, am I the only one asking for this stuff? Because it's oh, always, so, it's not readily available. So I must be the only, like one of the only ones to, to want You're one stuff. of a, just a few, you know, I, I mean, I've had like at labels, they have label copy and it's all like in a drive and yeah. label publicists can get it. But as an indie, you don't usually get it. So I, if you're, I don't get why, I mean, sometimes I think like, okay, if the person doesn't write their own stuff, maybe they want to hide that fact. If there's mm -hmm. like eight names next to one song or something, but in, in kind of like a EDM pop world, that's normal now, yeah. not something to be, to judge a, a person on. Um, yeah, I always feel like I'm like driving the publicist a little bit crazy, but at the same time, I'm like, that's the gig. Doesn't though. that make sense? Like, why? Like, I need this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Cheese is saying he loves your attention to detail. And it's true. You have a lot of attention to detail that a lot of people don't have. Like, that's what I mean when I say, like, real journalists. Like, and that's the, all I've been talking to here is, are real journalists, like, people who love the job and do the job really well. And I know Stephanie's there. She She's saying, I love this. Uh, and she just started her own PR company. So you'll get to know her at some point. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think we all, you know, I, I get lyrics from day one because uh, I yeah. want to know what the songs mean. Not every yeah. publicist does that though, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I have a new client and they were like shocked that I wanted their lyrics. I mean, the thing is <laughs> like music fans, music lovers, people who have been, you know, discovering music and going to concerts since they were in their teens, sometimes early teens. It's just like someone learning baseball stats, you know, like yeah. you, like to me, I want to know all that stuff. You know, like, I don't want to do a half-assed interview with, like, a set of 10 questions. Like, I want it personalized and individual to that specific person. And the way I'm going to do a better interview and write a better article is by reading all those liner notes and listening to the lyrics and knowing the instrumentation. Like, if there's a cello or if there's a right. tuba or, be like, whatever. Like, yeah, it might seem little, and maybe it is inconsequential, but maybe that artist took cello in grade, you know, seventh grade or something. Like, yeah. I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to ask and where the conversation is going to go. But if I don't have the information, it kind of drives me crazy. Like the week later, I read another story and like, it's like, frick, I didn't know that, you know? Mm. I don't know. So th those are my, those are I my talk to you. I get it. That's only because you're it. as detailed as you are. You know, I mean, it's not at my experience, in my experience, not everybody does pay attention to detail as much as you do. But that might not go in the article. It's just the more I know, the, the better. Like I ha made a, a, a mistake of like, as I'm trying to get more info, went on Wiki for something and I can't remember who I talked to, but I asked them about it and they're like, yeah, that's not, that's not true. Right. Well, but it's like, I'm just trying to get as much information as possible. Oh yeah. I, uh, Loudwire, I think it is. They do Wikipedia fact or fiction. And they That's go through the Wikipedia great. entry and it is That's pretty great, you know, and, and it's pretty fun to watch. Um, you know, and, and I, I'm always recommending to people to be on Twitch and to, get really in with the fans. Now, do, like I'm a fan of journalism and that's why I love talking to writers. I love hearing about their process. I remember I worked at Musician Magazine and one of my first jobs and I got to talk to JD Considine and I told him what a fan I was of his work. 
he's Doesn't in Toronto. He live here now? Yeah, he lives he lives yeah, in yeah, Canada. Yeah. Yeah. And he was laughing because he thought it was ridiculous that I was starstruck talking to him. But I'd been reading him forever. Right. Yeah. I mean, who? Yeah. I mean, a lot of journalists will go on to write books. Yeah. Right. And people have asked me Are to do that. Do Not ask. They say I should do that, I should yeah. say. But I feel weird doing that. I would do an authorized biography. Yeah. But I wouldn't do an unauthorized one because I feel like I don't want to cobble together someone's story from other stories. Yeah. Because people change their minds. Years go by and something they might have said 10, 20 years ago is not valid. I just feel uncomfortable about doing that. I, I wouldn't do it. Yeah, no. I, most of the people I've been talking to lately have written authorized books and collaborated with artists. And I think you'd be great at that. Well, also there's... In Canada, mm -hmm. no money in it. I was asked to write oh. something for a very big, very cool Canadian artist. And they were going to pay me three grand Canadian. What's that? 2200 US. And it was going to be a proper biography. And as much as I wanted to do it, I said, the only way I would do it is like, a, I was trying to think how I could justify that time. And it would be if I did it sort of album by album. So I would just like interview her about her, whatever, let's say dozen albums and each chapter would be uh, an album. And maybe that was an easy way. And they're like, no, we want it to be like a bio, like a biography. Like, and I'm like, I cannot, I am not doing that man for yeah. 2,200 bucks. Not a ch but a lot of people I know have proper jobs, salaried positions, and then they just churn out books because that's almost like a hobby it's yeah. not a money maker but this is how I make my living so right. I can't do that and we need to find better alternatives for freelancers and and I figure like the way I see it is it's kind of our job as publicists now to make it as easy for you as possible I mean on the I'd, I'd love to I need to find um an outlet that I can interview rock bands like actual bands uh or singer songwriters because right now i'm doing a lot of trade stuff um industry stuff and i'm doing you know some uh hip-hop and r&b for complex canada which oh. i love too like that i'm glad i have that outlet that's awesome um and but they're selective too because of the pandemic right they have to they still want eyeballs so you can't write about every newcomer you know, I'm for as much as people want to. Um, and then I've got Samaritan and the odd other outlet. You know, I write for So Can, the, oh. which is always us songwriters. But like that goes through a process there too. Sure. You know, they have to be approved. And um, you got to call so, my friend at Discogs. Yes. Yes. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. But I would love to write for like Revolver. Right. Um, or any kind of the odd time, like years ago, I would do something from Metal Hammer or Raw. I don't know if that's still around. I um, I'd love to write for, I used to write years ago. I know that uh, Melody Maker's not around anymore, but uh, I think I did a couple of pieces for NME, oh, but I can't really? even, they won't even return my messages now. Like, cause I was going to England quite a, I, I was born there. So I was there a few times. Um, well, a year ago, actually, and the year before, and I tried to get into enemy. No one returned the call. So. Oh, well, we got to find but more places I, for you. I did like a documentary on an artist, JD yeah. Fortune. Um, so I would love to do that again. I, uh, I someone's doing a documentary on a big uh, U.S. Uh, pop singer and I happen to be uh, the first person to interview her in Canada many, many years ago. And I had some pretty cool stuff. So I sold them the audio. And over the years, I've, I've sold some, like when there's an anniversary coming up, like I gave my Kurt Cobain uh, interview, which was very funny at the time because um, they hadn't exploded yet. I was supposed to interview, I think, Chris, and I called the hotel, and he wasn't there. And they're like, oh, do you want to interview Kurt? And I'm like, is that the drummer? 
That is what I said. Yep. Uh, anyway, so I have a pretty, I had a pretty fun interview with Kurt uh, that I I think Billboard reran it. Mm. And uh, if, if anyone paying attention to this is in touch with Eddie Vedder, I loved Ten Pearl Jam. And before that, I had interviewed Mother Love Bone. Um, before uh, Andrew had, sorry, Andrew had passed away, but they were releasing the um, album. And then, so they told me about Pearl Jam and I went to uh, Sam J or maybe it was New Music Seminar. I can't remember what it was mm -hmm. at the time. And I saw Pearl Jam and freaking Eddie was amazing. <laughs> I went the next night too in this tiny, tiny place. And, and then by the time I interviewed him, it was like the best interview. He was talking about like surfing and uh, preserving his voice and that he didn't like tattoos, but not to publish that because his good friends like Anthony uh, Katis. And anyway, it's the frick. And then at the end, he's like, oh, if you need anything else, you know, let me know. Never interviewed him ever again. Oh, wow. So he would be great for Samaritan. Yeah, I know he doesn't totally interview, would. but... That's like, and Keith Richards is my dream interview. Oh, nice. Spring clean, I shoot high. Those we are my have love. a question, actually, that, that is really relevant to now. Um, what's your take on the Marilyn Manson stuff that's been in the press? What's my take? Like, I mean, did you know about how he was before? Like, did you, have you ever I, interviewed him? I don't think so. Someone asked me that yesterday. I mean, I don't know. Like, I mean, clearly this is great that he's been exposed and the repercussions and that is exactly people should not be rewarded for that kind of behavior. Right. Um, you know, all I know is just behavior at shows like in Canada, he yeah. canceled a couple of years ago because uh, allegedly he was drug addled and he, um, yeah, like can't he was playing with uh, Rob Zombie, I believe, and can't oh, even though he was at the venue. Um, but that's a different issue. That's like drug addiction, and I completely am sympathetic to that. And someone sorting out their problems and getting help, uh, abusing people, you know, no. Yeah. Um, thing. And actually, I do like the way that there's been swift response to yeah. most people that uh victims have come forward finally and you know wow. felt comfortable like speaking out um in canada we've had a few uh instances where that hasn't happened uh which is unfortunate i don't know if people are more cautious here uh you know you can't write a story without having corroboration. Yeah. Um, I read, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, what was the book that, um, the Weinstein book, Catch? Oh, um, was it Ronan Farrow's book, Catch Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, anyway, that book is fantastic. It's written like a, spy novel like oh, i loved it the amount of work he did for years and years and the fact that other journalists tried to take this guy down and weren't successful for obvious reasons um and then they passed on their uh research and information to him like it took years um you know also like like weinstein had people like following him and yeah. pretending they were other people like I mean it's just pure insanity um yeah. that book and is then, amazing though yeah fantastic book uh, but you know there's been other very thorough uh pieces there was one last week about the SoCal scene uh about a label out there um so you've got corroboration from friends from family that that victim did confide in them and tell them yeah. um there's like multiple victims i mean you you can't ruin someone's life like you can't write a story based on one allegation even if you do believe that person you definitely from a legal standpoint have to have the right uh you know information and so. that's happened to a lot of bands i remember i think it was one of the canadian bands i worked 
was it Headley or was Headley? It yeah, um, Jacob Hogarth, mm -hmm. the singer. I believe um, the court case is going to happen like this year. Oh, wow. Um, and then uh, Simple Plan uh, might have been under the radar because of the pandemic, but uh, one of the members of Simple Plan, um, uh, a woman went on uh, Reddit. Yeah. I, I don't know if that was the first place. It could have been on a Twitter account, but um, had posted something on Reddit and then other people came forward about uh, just as, yeah, abuse and creepy behavior and the power dynamic is a big one, you know, so there's abuse and there's rape and there's, you know, drugging people and torturing them. There's that. And then there's the power dynamic issues. Yeah, totally. Um, oh yeah. TikTok, uh, Stephanie was saying it's wild. That the simple plan thing hit under the radar, especially since TikTok brought them back into the spotlight. Yeah, that is amazing that that went under the radar, but there's been so much like news coming at us lately about like, at least in America for sure about like the storming of the Capitol and all the politics. Like I yeah. can't watch television. I, anymore. Uh, your politics is my politics because <laughs> the, what happens there infiltrates, comes across and impacts, um, our country, our citizen, we have anti-maskers here. We have people that are pro-Trump. Um, mm -hmm. Every day was insanity. I feel like I should sue him for like lost income because I spent <laughs> hours. Sometimes I something oh. would happen. I turn on CNN and like there goes my entire freaking afternoon. It's a quieter life now, I have to say. Like, I'm like, oh, I don't have to like be glued to the news every day. Like, I'm not worried. Uh, I mean, there's still issues, but it's yeah. like, there's there's like a big sigh of relief for, I think, sane people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Karen, you're in Toronto, right? Yeah, because Stephanie is saying she lives uh, north of Seattle, two hours from the border. So uh, she was asking if you were over there, but you're on this side of the country. Um, I think that it's interesting to know like what you read and what you watch like as a Canadian, because it, you know, it, all of it kind of does flow over to you. Um, but another thing I wanted to ask you was like, what, music books or like what journalists are you reading lately like you know i i love the ronan farrow book it was amazing i read it twice but uh yeah no that, that was definitely great um i have to say i have been taking i'm big on the library these days because i have no room on my bookshelf at <laughs> all um I like the autobiographies more than biographies, you know, even if those people are leaving stuff out because they don't want to hurt someone's feelings, their fourth wife or whatever the situation <laughs> is. Um, but so I've got Elton John's. Oh. Um, I just like a wide range of, that I'm waiting for. Michael J. Fox. Oh, I've got the Obama book. Has any, have you read it? Obama's I haven't. Book? No, I'm not really into biographies. I I'm, I'm doing a lot of listening to podcasts lately, all true crime. Just to oh, get my head I'm out like of music. I'm not. Every weekend, it's like Dateline, NBC, 48 hours. Um, I would not be able to get away with murder because my hair, like, it's good to know. My hair just falls everywhere. So it's like, <laughs> all right, no, no murdering in my uh, future. And I that's good, a good thing. Yeah. yeah. And you're always watching and you're like, do not Google undetectable poison. You know, like don't these people know, <laughs> right? Oh my so. God, yeah. Uh, yeah. Are you listening to any podcasts these days or no? I haven't got into that. And I think part of it is because uh, I am at home and I'm lazy. There's snow outside. I think I'm going to start walking for an hour. I think people listen to podcasts, if I'm not mistaken, if they're commuting or if they're walking. I but lay I in bed feel... listening to podcasts. So. Sorry? I lie in bed listening to podcasts. Oh, so. I'm just doing other stuff. I'm watching yeah. my true crime. 
things. Yeah, so well, they cool. haven't. So I want people to know, like, the URL, is it SamaritanMag.com or Mag? Yeah. Okay. So Samaritan Mag, I mean, if you have any suggestions or anyone listening or any of your friends, like, I'm not a great business person. I'm more creative. So I can source stories, write them, edit them, assign. But, like, I really want to get support, like, sponsors for it advertisers products to review um there's no shortage of interviews and, and of course i'm open um we got to talk about I this want, We've been i want to get about like i want to get like sponsors for sections or um yeah. just advertising and not because someone like cares what my readership is but because they believe in this and they're like I, like I had Justin Timberlake, I interviewed him uh, for Billboard, I think. Yeah, for Billboard. Um, he was in town during TIFF. And my last like two minutes, I asked him about like causes and charities. And he was like, why'd you ask me about that? And I told him about Samaritan. He's like, that's a great idea. He's like, you should talk to my publicist. So like I did and I followed up, but then nothing happens because they don't care, right? Like. And often I interview an artist for another publication. And at the end, like Pete Townsend, it was about his book. And he gave me like 15 more minutes for Samaritan. And like, I've had tons of people say like, oh, I love what you're doing. Or, um, you know, I'm proud of you. And Brian Adams tell me he was proud of me, which meant a lot. And um well, but the, public, the, the publicist, it. they want to know, they're like, oh, they're not doing interviews or like, I wanted to interview uh, Wolfgang um, Van, uh, Van Halen because he had a charity single and I couldn't get an interview. He was doing interviews everywhere. You would think he would want to talk to a publication that was like only about causes and charities, but we're not big enough and the publicist doesn't care. Right. So I can't get it. Karen, we're going to work on it. We keep saying we're going to work on this, but we're actually going to work on this now that we're both <laughs> home. Like, I promise I will call you and we will do this because it's the, the charitable aspect is very important to me as well. And there's a lot of people that I know that I can connect, you know, and I know. Like if I could get it bigger, let's just say in my dream, yeah. Mark Cuban, where someone like loves what I do, you know, Timberlake. And he wants to put money behind it. Then I can hire more writers. I can hire social media, but also I could have like a charity associated. So it could be um, playing for change or like it could be anything really like the, yeah. and give back in that way that might be music focused. Like I don't want to turn it into a not-for-profit because I'd like to one day yeah. make a good living and have my dream swimming pool however <laughs> like maybe there could be a do some donation buttons where I, I don't on the site endorse charities I have to be very careful of that there's yeah. a disclaimer because in Canada some of the bigger charities had some shady goings on so um I but but if it's something like playing for change or you know, here we have music counts and, and unison and you've got music cares. And if it's something we know is legit, uh, war child is another one I'm a big fan of. Um, I would all like, I would love to do that, you know? Absolutely. <laughs> it, and let me say before we go, I do have a very generous philanthropic, Canadian music industry person, uh, Gary Slate, who has been uh, extremely supportive of Samaritan since I started. And without him, like the guy's amazing. If you look him up, honestly, the family's incredible. They used to own um, uh, radio stations and now they're just extremely generous for in the area of healthcare and music. Um, and he believes in me and, and what I'm doing. So he, his contribution allows me to pay my writers not a, as much as I'd like to, but enough that they still sort of write for me. So. That's amazing. And and I, I see in chat, you know, Karen, do a stream, please. Uh, Karen would, would be great at podcasting. So 
<laughs> you know, you, you you definitely would have some listeners there. Um, but yeah, we're going to work on a campaign for Samaritan. I, I've always wanted to do this. And now that I'm Indy again, I can. So uh, we're going to we're going to do it, Karen. That would be amazing. Um, yes, absolutely. Well, thank you for being here. And uh, is there socials that you want people to hit up or? Um. Well, you could go to SamaritanMag.com and sign up to our newsletter. I don't bombard. Um, and ju- I mean, my socials, you'll see how pathetic I am. But yeah, there, <laughs> there's a Samaritan Mag Twitter. I'm on Twitter fairly when I remember it exists. <laughs> I have a personal Instagram account that you'll also, you'll see my Shishito peppers that I made last night. <laughs> I saw that already. Yeah. <laughs> That's not the most exciting. Um, We're going to work on that too, Karen. Oh, no. I'm not going to have any hours in the day to watch Dateline NBC. Oh, my goodness. You are There's only so many hours in the day. Oh, my goodness. All right. Thank you. And this was a lot of fun. And thank you, everyone, for checking it out and uh, live and on tape. And we will see you next week. All right. Thank you. Thank you.